We've been in a series of messages talking about God's presence, um, knowing his presence. What does it mean to be in God's presence? What is that about? And how as believers and followers of Jesus, um, I believe that we're supposed to live our lives to be people who are driven to know God and to know his presence. You know that in the Bible, when you read different passages that talk about God's presence, um, the presence of God, uh, simply what it means is to be before the face of God. Uh, It's meeting with God face to face. It's being made aware of his spirit. Uh, It's being made aware of his voice, uh, his power, his love, uh, sensing his nearness in your life. Now, we're always before God every day, um, and yet there are times when you we especially become aware of God. There's times where we especially know him. We especially know his nearness. And so we desire that. We desire God's presence. We desire to know him and to be changed by him. We desire to be empowered by his spirit. Um, we need his spirit in our lives. Look at this verse out of Psalm 27. Um, it says, this is the amplified version, and you have said, seek my face. Inquire for and require my presence as your vital need. So my heart says to you, your face, your presence, Lord, will I seek. Psalm 27 tells us to seek God with all your heart. God desires that you be a person, you be the kind of person that seeks him in this kind of way. It means knowing that you vitally need God's presence in your life. It means that it's not enough for me. It's not enough for you to just have knowledge of God. It's not enough for me, Lord, to just have some Bible knowledge. But I need to know you. I need to hear from you, God. I want to sense you. I want to be near you in a special way. We should want to be close to him more than anything else presence-driven kind of people. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would make us those kind of people, Lord, that you would draw us into your presence. You would make us aware of you, Lord, specially aware of you. That You would cause us to hear your voice, to sense you, Lord, that you would lead our lives, God, that you would meet with us, Lord Jesus, that you would shed abroad the love of Christ in our hearts, Lord God, And I pray that you would do that this morning, Lord Jesus. Speak to our hearts today, God. I pray that you would speak through this message. Your words, let it be your words and not my own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible talks about, well, there's several individuals that you can find in the Bible who are presence-driven kind of people. Um, But the Bible says that there's a man, talks about a man named Asaph. He was a worshiper in King David's court. And like David, Asaph, he was the kind of man who was after God's own heart. He was that kind of guy. Now, a major part of what it means to be after God's own heart, you can maybe sum it up as, as being he was an individual who was driven to know the presence of God. He was driven to be in God's presence. He, wanted, he was driven to be led of God's spirit. He loved God. Listen to his prayer Asaph in Psalm 73. He prays, and really it's a song. He says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You can see a heart cry, and you can see some driving motivations in this individual Asaph, this presence-driven kind of person, even by just looking at these few verses in Psalm 73. He says, God, you guide me with counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. So that means that Asaph, the way that he lives his life, he kind of has eternity in his mind. He knows that life right now, life is fleeting. It's fleeting. He knows that life is about knowing God now and afterward being received unto God forever. He looks forward to it. Then he says, whom have I in heaven but you? 
and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. And when I hear those words from Asaph, I think, man, what love for God. This guy loves God. The presence-driven individual, they simply desire God more than they desire anything else. When other desires rise up, greater than God in, in your life, the presence-driven individual, what they do is, is they go to God, and all those other things they lay before him, they bring to him. They bring those things before God. They have a talk with God. Asaph, he then says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It means that Asaph, he knows his dire need for God. He knows I need God in my life. He knows his dependence on God, and he sees the Lord as his portion forever. Now, what does portion mean? In the Bible, in the original language, portion, it just means an inheritance. It means a promise. It means the forever source of blessing and happiness. And so he says, God is my portion forever. He has the best inheritance imaginable in God. He does not seek any possession or comfort outside of God. And so I think that when you look at Asaph and you see all these things, you see that he's eternity, you know, has eternity in mind. You see his love for God, his desire for God over all things. You see a contentness in his life just to know God. I just want to know him. And then at the same time, you see this, this thing in him where he knows that he desperately needs God. When you put those things together, you start to see these characteristics and these kind of dry principles that make up the kind of person that's a presence-driven person. You can be this person. Live your life to know God and to just personally be there before God's face. I want to know you, God. Just like we were singing a second ago. You can be that kind of person. Now, as Asaph, as he lives that out, it's no wonder why he ends his psalm saying this. He says in, in, in verse 28, But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. We have to fight against all kinds of things that are trying to take up the attention of our hearts and our lives more than God, and we need to put God in his rightful place. When we do that, when you do that, what you do is you, are, you make room. You welcome and invite the presence of God to invade your heart and your life. It is good to be near God. And I just think, man, the presence of God, there's nothing like it. Man, when you're in God's presence and you're being specially made aware that he's close and that he's near, there is nothing like it. I can remember one time in my life, I was a lot younger, I just had this desire one day to, to have some alone time. just want to get in my, my home alone there in my room. And I just felt compelled to worship God, to spend some time worshiping him. Now, what you need to know is that at this time in my life, it had been a while since I had done something like that. It had been a while since I just took some alone time to worship God. Uh, there had been some things that had happened in my life uh, that had um, deflated me. There were some things that I had been hurt by. That happened. And while that's no excuse to put God off at all, again, I just felt deflated. I felt checked out. The things that have transpired in my life at that point. And sadly, I just kind of put worshiping God to the side. It's not good. It's not okay. And not, of course, it's not a good place to be. But after some time, you know, I just decided one day, you know what, I'm going to worship God. I want to do this. I want to spend time there. And so, so I began to pray. I got alone. I started to, I just spent some time praying to God. And then after I spent some time praying for a little bit, 
I began to just sing some songs to God. I put on some worship music, and I just started singing to God. And do you know that before long, man, I started to sense the presence of God. I could sense a peace that was just flooding in. It was like peace was welling up in me. Uh, I could sense my heart was like being moved on the inside. After I had been there, I prayed. I was worshiping for a little bit, and I could sense my heart being moved. And it's like you want to cry, but you have no re- you, you don't have any reason why. You're not sure why you want to cry, but you just you, you start to sense it, and, and you sense the Holy Spirit sort of flooding in. That's the best way I could describe in words. But as I'm there, and I'm, I'm moved to tears. Knowing God's presence, being specially made aware of God's presence, I hear the Lord say something. God spoke something. You know what God said? I heard him say, there in his presence, I heard the Lord say, I've longed to hear your worship. And that just broke me. You know why? Because God wanted to be near me, even in my state of hurt and brokenness, and even some of my pride just deciding I'm going to be checked out. Even in that place, God, he wanted to be near me. He wants to be near you. God knew that the only solution and remedy for where I was at, the only solution was to actually be close to God, not further from him. And the same is true for your life. The solution to Whatever place you're at, it's to be closer to him, not further from him. And so there in God's presence, it was just so powerful how the Lord ministered to me. As I made a decision and sought to just worship him and minister to him. Your worship of God, it's special to him. The worship's not about your abilities. It's not about how good you can sing or sound. Worship is all about your heart before God. And when you come before him, uh, just to have time with him because you love him, you come before God just to have time with him because he's God and you just want to acknowledge before him that he is God, man, it touches the Father's heart. It touches God's heart. Now, I know that the Lord was speaking in this situation, in this moment, Because I had been putting off worship for some time. I had been putting that off. I was checked out. And how merciful and gracious was God. Now, when I heard God speak, I didn't hear him like audibly to my ears. But it's like you hear him on the inside. Very clearly. And I was younger at the time, maybe 23, 24. And... As it happened, I, at that time in my life, I was, I was just getting to know my future wife. I wanted to pursue her as in a relationship, a more than friends kind of relationship. But I didn't want to do that without getting God's approval or God's leading. I want to know, God, is this, is this something, uh, you know, that you have for my life? And so I'm thinking, you know what? I'm right here in the presence of God. God has been ministering to me. I just heard God speak something amazing. Now, again, this is, there's, there's quite a bit of time that has gone on here in this moment, but, I, but this comes to my mind, and I think, well, I, I've got God here. I'll just ask him about it. And so I said, Lord, should I pursue this individual? I heard the Lord speak clear as day. Do you know what I heard the Lord say? He said, I have ordained it. Now, I felt it was very important to keep that to myself for the next three years until after our wedding day. I did not tell my wife about that until after we were married. But in hindsight, I know the Lord spoke. And I am so grateful for his presence and his mercy, his compassion, his leading in my life. I want more times like that with God. I want you to have times like that with God. There's nothing more beautiful than the presence of God. And again, I think that as believers and followers of Jesus, I I believe we should be driven to know God and know his presence and be close to him. 
Now, I think we would all say, yeah, I want to be close to God. Yes, we want to know him. That's why I'm, you know, I came to church the first day of the week. I've made time to come and honor God. We want to know God in a deep and personal way. I believe, though, that there's a cost. There's a cost to knowing God in a deep way. There's a, to, to have that special closeness with God comes with a cost. We want more of God's presence in our lives, but the cost of continually knowing God's special presence, part of that cost, it means living set apart for him. Over the last few weeks, we looked at a couple costs of knowing God. You can see these things all all throughout the Bible. Obviously, the first is just coming to faith in Jesus and believing him to be who he says that he is. But there's more to go deeper with God. Man, there's, there's sacrifices that we have to make. And one of them means living set apart from everything and anything else that could pollute and hinder your relationship with God. It's living in a way where you separate yourself from anything unholy. Uh, you separate yourself from anything that could grab hold of your heart, your devotion, and your affections, any, anything that's grabbing a hold, hold of your heart more than God is, more than God has of you. You separate yourself from those things. Do you know that in Christ, through your faith in Jesus, his blood washes and covers your life? In Christ, you're made a whole new creation. And do you know that in Christ, you have now been specially reserved for God. Do you know that? You've been specially reserved for God. Through repentance and faith in Jesus, his spirit living in you now, he has specially set you apart as a, as a person unto himself. You're reserved for him. Now, of course, we have families, we have relationships, we have jobs, we have responsibilities. But above all, you have been set aside by God and for God. It's not a scary thing. It's a loving thing. He says, you're mine. You're my child now. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who did what? Who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. God has called us in Christ out of darkness into his wonderful light. What is that light? It's the light of God's love, his grace, his mercy, his spirit living in you, his power, his forgiveness, his blessing, all those kinds of things. And now you belong to him. And since you do, since God's reserved you, especially for himself now, he calls us to, to no longer walk in darkness, but to walk in his light. Now, if Jesus died so that my sin could be washed away. And along with all my guilt and shame, all that stuff could be done away with. If Jesus died so that you could stand blameless in God's sight and be his special possession, when I think about I, that, I ask myself, am I living my life then in a way to reserve myself for him? If you're saying, God, that, that I'm yours now, then I want to live to be yours. I think that to myself. To live set apart. It means that you reserve yourself for God. You belong to him. And so there's a willing part that we each play in that as well now. You can't earn your salvation. You can't earn right standing with God. But now that we've been saved and redeemed... We live in response to what God's done. We live in response to the cross. And we, we choose to live in response to that great love of God shown to us. So in response to God's incredible love demonstrated on the cross, we choose to live set apart for God as he has now set you apart unto himself. 
Now, for your heart and life to be reserved for God, again, it means separating yourself from anything that displeases God. And this is part of the cost of regularly knowing God's presence. Many people have times and moments where, man, they're just overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. But if you want that continually in your life, if you want to know him, there's a cost. There's a sacrifice in our decisions that we make. Part of the, it's also part of the cost of just following Jesus. Living your life to please him because you love him. But Hebrews 12, 14, it says this, Pursue peace with everyone and pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. We're called to pursue holiness. You are loved by God. You're made right in God's sight through faith in Jesus. That's your positional holiness in Christ. He's paid for and canceled your debt of sin. But then the New Testament calls us to holiness in our actions and in the way we live. 1 Peter uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 15 says, But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. This is written to New Testament believers, people who've been saved from punishment for their sin. Jesus, people who have been saved through faith in Jesus, coming under that, receiving that atonement for their sin, and yet they're called to pursue holiness in their conduct and in their speech. See, now that we've been specially reserved for God, you belong to him, we now live as his children. And more than children, we live as his bride, the bride of Christ, his church. We set ourselves apart for him. Think about a marriage. In a marriage, you live set apart for your spouse. At least you should. It means that your eyes are only for your spouse. It means that your affections are only for your spouse. Uh, The conversations you have with your spouse about deeper things, your fears, your worries, your desires. There are things reserved for only you and your spouse to converse on and to share with each other. It's because in a marriage, there's a kind of living set apart for each other to love your spouse. That's why there's a cost to marriage, a good marriage. It costs both individuals something. And so what do you do? You get rid of things that hinder the the marriage relationship. You make personal changes to honor and love your spouse. In a healthy marriage, you quit living for yourself. You quit trying to live like you're single, try to act like you're single, even though you're married. You, You stop all that. It means selflessness, and you start to make sacrifices for each other. Why? Because you're living set apart for your spouse. You might sacrifice entertainment. You sacrifice time with other people. You might even sacrifice certain friendships in your life. doesn't mean that they go away entirely, but the time in those friendships, maybe it goes down some because you're living set apart for your spouse. Now, the same is true with God, but on a greater level. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for relationship with you and I. He gave his life. He laid down his life, endured torture and pain. He was murdered on that cross so that you and I could have closeness with him. God will honor the person who seeks to live set apart for him now. Jesus died so that we could have relationship with him and he made the ultimate sacrifice for closeness with us again this is a simple skit to show just how dysfunctional and wrong it would be to have a relationship where one is truly not set apart for the other you know that galatians 3 says that christ has purchased you with his blood exodus 34 says this that god is a jealous god He's jealous, meaning he's jealous for relationship with his people because he passionately loves them. God honors the individual who seeks to please him by living set apart for him. And a lot of times that comes with 
you know, choosing even to reject many things in this life, things that occupy our hearts, your mind, rejecting things to love and serve God. I believe all of this is part of the cost of not only following Jesus, but part of the cost of knowing his presence, going deeper with God, saying, God, I'm going to set myself apart for you. You made the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus, so I could have a relationship with you. I am going to set my, myself apart and live specially reserved for you. And Jesus talks about the church as his bride. One day here soon, he's going to come back for his bride and receive the church unto himself. And so we live set apart. Being set apart means you're in this world. We all live in this world, but you're no longer of this world. You live set apart for God. It's to be in this world, but to not be of it. What does that mean? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says this, For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with the devil? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So then verse 17 says this. Therefore, since you're the people of God, since he lives in you, he has sent the Holy Spirit to reside in you. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. This is New Testament, written to New Testament believers. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Let me ask you a question. Should there be a noticeable difference between Christians and non-Christians? Should there be a difference between Christians and the rest of the world? Should there be a difference? Should there be a noticeable difference in how a Christian chooses to live their life? I believe so. The scriptures say yes. Christians are called to be holy and, and set apart. And different. As, as followers of Jesus, we're like exiles in this world. But we allow our lives to reflect the gospel and the good news that we have. What is that good news again? God has made a way for sinful people to be forgiven and to have eternal life. Just by believing in Jesus. Repentance and believing in him. It's amazing news. So on one hand, we pursue holiness to honor God, and we pursue holiness to honor Jesus' sacrifice. And yet also we pursue holiness, and we live different so that we can make a difference in this world by pointing the world to Jesus, by showing the world a very different kind of life in Christ. Do you know that one of the biggest downfalls uh, to the Roman Colosseum, the Roman games, one of the biggest Uh, downfalls was that the Christians, as more and more Christian people came to faith in Christ, they refused to to take part in in those Roman games, the Colosseum. More and more Christians refused to just watch people killing each other. And why did they do it? Well, they did it to honor God, to pursue holiness. Uh, They believed life was sacred, that we're made in the image of God. And so as Christians started to just Uh, reject being a part of that, it started to have an effect on the rest of the world. It had an effect of waking the rest of the world up to a standard of godly righteousness and morality. People started to, to say things they never thought for themselves. And these Christians, they don't take part. They live different. Why? And it was actually a big part of the downfall of those Roman games. We're called to be in this world, but not of this world. And actually, Jose and Devin, if you guys are in here, you can make your way up. 
as a Christian, it doesn't mean you isolate yourself from society. You can't do that. You'd have to remove yourself from the world. We live in a world with all kinds of cultures that are godless. There's many godless ideas. You'd have to take yourself out of the world to avoid it all. But as a Christ follower, there's points, there will be points in your life where you don't compromise God's standards wherever you are. There will be points in your life where society looks at you and thinks you're crazy. You're different. Why do you choose to live that way? Why do you choose to live differently? You don't do it to prove anything, but you do so because you love God. And I believe that as you do, others start to see God in your life. They see the hand of God in your life. They see the imprint of Jesus on your life. I want to end this message this morning by reading out of Ephesians chapter 4. This is exactly uh, what, what Paul is getting at to the early Christians. We're in this world. We're not of this world. We're called to live set apart for God. Here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 4, 17. says, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Verse 20. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So then get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. See, we're called to live different, the way of Jesus. The Bible calls us to live set apart now that you belong to Jesus. I just want to read that one line again from verse 30. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. You can have an assurance about that because of the price Jesus paid on the cross to just wash away all your sin. When we stand before God, we're not going to be say, we're not going to be able to say, well, it's because I was a good person or I did this. No, when we stand before God one day, we're going to say, we're going to point at Jesus and say, look, I, the only reason I can be here is because of what he has done. Because he was perfect and righteous in every way. And because Jesus laid down his life for this sinful man. The Bible calls us to now live your life reserved for him. And as we pursue God in this way, man, it, op it only opens the door to knowing him deeper. So the first step that we take is repentance. It's always that first step. And those things in our lives that we know aren't pleasing to God. To live set apart, the first step we start to take is repentance. We bring those things to God. We, say, we ask God to forgive us for those things. To cleanse my life. That's the first step. The second step is you start to make choices to separate yourself from those things. But Jesus, we thank you this morning for the cross. Your amazing love, God. Powerful love demonstrated on the cross for sinful people. We thank you, Jesus, that we can have an assurance about our salvation because it's not about what we do. It's about what you have done. You died and you rose again. 
And Lord, I pray that you would empower us to live for you, Lord Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit to live set apart for you, Lord. We need your guidance. We need your help, Lord God. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for that mercy that's new every morning, Lord, that we can come to you every day, Lord, confessing our sins, our shortcomings, our failures, Lord, desiring to turn from those things, Lord, and we could receive forgiveness and mercy because of what you've done on the cross. We love you, Lord Jesus.